Okay, so welcome everyone to a Wednesday evening uh, Clear Mountain. This will be an interview, and we're very happy to hear have uh, Ajahn Yaniko here. Uh, we're currently at Wat Bananachat, the International Forest Monastery, and uh, we're very grateful. Thank you very much, Tanajan, for agreeing to the interview. And uh, yeah, we were hoping we could ask you questions about on the subject of, of pilgrimage, um, as many of our pilgrims have been coming and paying respects to various different teachers here in Thailand and, and going to pay respects at the Bodhi tree in India. So yeah, thank you. Yeah, good to be here. So, Ajahn, we know you're setting out on a bit of pilgrimage of your own at the moment. Uh, do you want to talk about what this uh, next few months will look like for you? Yeah, next next few months. So, of course, I'm at Wapananacha right now, and having uh, done five vasas as an abbot, as a new abbot, and also having reached 20 vasas as a bhikkhu, it's kind of a I guess you could say it's kind of a turning point for myself. So it's, I kind of think of it as like the Idipadas, like Chittaviri, uh, Chandaviriya, Chittavimangsa. This is the Vimangsa period for me. So like reviewing mm. what worked, what didn't work. How could I do things better? How can I adjust things? And also just taking some time for myself, looking after my own practice. So I'm in Thailand now. I'm going to be here till about early July and have some ideas to spend time in India at Bodh Gaya, at a place where I, I enjoy practicing, meditating. And after that, spending a couple months in retreat at a uh, cave in Korat province, which uh, has a kuti. I won't be like in a cave the whole time, but there's a kuti and then a cave to practice at as well. And uh, be there for a couple months. And two months for me is a good period of time to be in complete seclusion. Of course, I'll be going alms around every day, but uh, complete seclusion. If if it's longer than that, I'm, I find I get diminishing returns. So that's just for myself. Some people might be able to use seclusion much better than that for much longer periods of time. But for me, uh, two months seems like a good period of time. And after that, it'll just be reconnecting with people post COVID, visiting friends and monks that I haven't seen for a while, lay people I haven't seen for a few years. So uh, that's just, it's not really a pilgrimage per se, more like a, a break. I don't, I guess I'm, it could, you could call it a sabbatical, but sabbatical is kind of a strange word, especially in terms of a monk. You know, words like retirement or sabbatical are kind of strange. And I mean, I, I retired from the world. That's why I'm a monk. I'm taking a permanent sabbatical from the world as a monk. <laughs> so, so uh, but yeah, just looking after my own practice, focusing more on my own practice rather than looking after a big community, helping others, just more helping myself for the time being. Mm. Yeah. Gotcha. And I mean, it seems like this idea of pilgrimage can be quite broad. I mean, you kind of frame it in terms of taking a break, but um, I mean, you will be going around and you're visiting teachers and friends and especially going back to the, the Bodhi tree. I know you've spent time at uh, Bodh Gaya before. Do you conceive of those as, as pilgrimages? And, and or as how, how do you conceive of your time in India? And how do you use your time there? Yeah, I, you know, I could, I kind of think of it as pilgrimage when I go and meditate at the Bodhi tree and don't really go anywhere else. I, I kind of think of it as pilgrimage. But I'm, I'm at a point in my practice where I don't really separate everything that I do every you could say all of it is pilgrimage all of it is tudong all of it is just the pilgrimage of the heart the pilgrimage that the heart is on just moving forward in the spiritual path moving forward in the holy life so you i i do think of it as pilgrimage in the sense that okay i'm going there to make stronger determinations for my own practice and ask the buddha's parami for help as i continue being abbot of abayagiri and just uh, that acknowledging that I do need help, I can't just do it on my own, and so. I really uh, appreciate those reflections about the kind of overarching ethic of, of pilgrimage, and you know, some of our community just went to Bodh Gaya, and I'm curious, you know, just about that specific form of pilgrimage. If you had a few stories you could share of your time there, you know, uh, kind of for inspiration and faith. Yeah, uh, yeah, definitely. There's this, uh, you're, you'll be familiar with my phrase, entering the mandala, 
So when you embark on some sort of practice or some sort of pilgrimage or any sort of journey, then uh, there is a period of difficulty. So usually that's what sticks out for me is those initial periods of difficulty that if you make it through that initial period of difficulty, then that's when you'll really gain your experience. That's when you'll really learn something. There almost seems to be a kind of some requisite frustration to go through if you're going to learn something new in these places. It's we don't really do it or we acknowledge it's not going to be easy. There's going to be inevitable challenges. So just one story, for example, I did these three separate trips to Bodh Gaya trying to clock up a thousand hours of sitting meditation under the Bodhi tree. And in the third trip, I actually went from Abayagiri straight oh, through through Bangkok to Bodh Gaya, straight back to the same sit spot. And I remember that time I was very jet lagged, but there was no real time to rest, wanting to clock up those hours. And so having to sit while being very tired, it's a 12 and a half hour difference from San Francisco to India. And so it's like, like being exactly the opposite but it's quite good just to go back to the sit spot, but then that's entering into that modality of practice, I guess. And and then there's these difficulties that always seem to happen in the first few days. And this seems to happen with retreats too. People always have difficulties on the second day, and sometimes the third day. It just seems to happen every time. First day is good, it kind of reels you in. And then the second day is just hell. This is all these failed expectations and wanting to get something from the retreat and not getting it. So no different with any spiritual practice that we take on, whether it's even something like ordination, we're going to inevitably have those failed expectations where we don't get whatever we thought we were going to get from ordaining. And so going back, being tired, sitting at the Bodhi tree. And then I remember first day, just putting my, I had these with this like faux leather bottom mats and uh, kind of keeps the dew and the moisture off of your sitting cloth and so uh, had one of these mats and then I usually the breaks would be dictated by having to get up and go use the restroom facilities and so about two and a half hour sit first day get up to use the restroom come back and there's a dog laying down asleep on my mat so uh, so then I just kind of trying to push the dog a little bit with my foot and it's not moving and then I kind of pushed the dog a bit harder and it yelped at me and got up and peed on my mat right there in front of me and so I'm wanting to start by clocking up some hours and there's dog pee all over my mat and so, <laughs> so I just looked at it and kind of thought for a bit and just flipped it over and sat on the kind of faux leather side, not on the cloth side, and and um, just washed it really thoroughly later that evening. <laughs> but just these little things that uh, they just seem to happen right in the beginning. There's a story of a bodhisattva bird, Ajahn. Yeah, the story of the bodhisattva bird. I hope I hope Ajahn Achalo is okay with me telling that. I think I think he will be. That was actually the previous visit to Bodh Gaya when he was trying to gather. I think it was 500 or 1,000 Bodhi leaves uh, for his uh, chedi that he was building at Anandagiri Monastery. And of course, you can't just go up and pick the leaves off the Bodhi tree. If, if we could do that, the whole tree would be bare all the time. But if leaves fall on you while you're meditating, then it's, it's considered okay to take them. And so he was making this determination for a certain number of Bodhi leaves and just kind of collecting them as they fell and then all these Bodhi leaves started falling and we looked up and there was this bird actually picking leaves off the tree and just dropping them on Ajahn Achalo. and I was sitting right next to him and none of them were being dropped on me they were all being dropped on him and he just had this pile of Bodhi leaves and uh, I wouldn't I probably wouldn't believe it if I didn't see it myself if somebody just told me this story and then uh, he was kind of like started laughing and he's like, look at this bird. And we were looking at it and it was just picking le leaves and dropping them on Ajahn mm. And And then he went up to use the restroom and the bird stopped. And it just stopped and waited. And then when he came back, it just started dropping leaves on him again. And so something like that is really 
you can't make it up. I mean, just <laughs> so the 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 really interesting thing about that that was near the end of our second session where I was still living in Thailand and I had gone from Thailand to Bodh Gaya. That time we were in there, we were at Bodh Gaya practicing for six weeks. That time and we were that was near the end of that six week chunk of practice, and so we decided on the last day to share the merit with the bird that dropped all these leaves on him and allowed him to uh, then keep his put the number of leaves enshrined in the chetty that he wanted to put in there and so we did we did like a sharing of merit for the bird for all the birds there and all all beings but uh, specifically for that bird that helped him out we called it bodhisattva bird and it was a it was a pigeon uh, there's a lot of pigeons there and so uh, then we shared the merit and did some more meditation and then there was a Vietnamese group doing circumambulations and then they wanted to offer Ajahnachalo and myself bags of goodies and blankets and uh, hats or whatever there was a it was like kind of like these these offering bags and the strange thing about this was it was pretty soon after we did this sharing of merit chant and they offered these bags and on the bags was a picture of a pigeon with a voice bubble coming out of it saying come back soon <laughs> so, i don't know i don't know what's going on here but uh, it was weird <laughs> Yeah, it, like on this on this point of like seeing being on pilgrimage or being on Tudong or the kind of walking, um, just without a clear idea of where your next meal is gonna from come from, uh, or maybe even being on sabbatical, like all of these things, kind of specifically like stretch one's faith and kind of like both like you see things which seem unbelievable and. Um, yeah, in, in certain ways, like, it can almost either test or stretch your faith, faith depending on, yeah, how you relate to it. Do you have any more yes. stories or reflections on that? Well said to say stretching the faith, because mm -hmm. what was, what comes up in my mind is the whole thing about going Tudong. Say, I could talk about Tudong in America uh, for not not super long Tudongs. Uh, the first one was just over a month, and the other the second one was two weeks, third one was 10 days, fourth one was three weeks. So not super long, but still you get things happening when you put yourself out there and don't know where you're gonna eat or sleep each night and don't really plan except the direction you're gonna walk. Would you define Tudong for our people who don't know what yeah, it is? Yeah, tu Tudong, Tudong comes from the word Dutanga, which means allowable ascetic practices that are special practices allowed by the Buddha that uh, help to heighten our practice, things like eating only once per day, like not having breakfast, or just eating out of the bowl, or only taking whatever dwelling you're assigned to you, which we mostly follow at a Bayagiri, and not, not picking and choosing your dwelling places. Uh, things like sitting up at night, what we call the Nisajika practice, and those are Dutanga practices. So, But Tudong has come to mean in Thai, monastic wandering and living living in the forest, finding secluded places to practice, and also wandering and living completely on faith. So the practice of Tudong is just that. It's a cultivation of the faith faculty. And it's cultivation of the faith faculty as a faculty. It's not necessarily having faith in something, but it's faith as a faculty in and of itself. And the word is sadha in Pali, and faith perhaps isn't a good word to use. It's maybe our best word we can find it also means like confidence or conviction but we could say it's conviction in the efficacy of what we're doing convic conviction in the monk's life conviction in our spiritual practice that's more what sadha is referring to and it also has hints of courage in there as well because it takes courage to really put yourself out there and be prepared for anything be prepared to not eat to not find a good place to stay to just have to sleep somewhere that's not comfortable or maybe not even be able to sleep. Maybe you just have to keep walking. So, but when you really, it also has 
Sadha also has a hint, like a connotations of openness. So if we think of these keywords, courage, openness, confidence, conviction, all those things are contained in the Pali word Sadha, the Buddhist version of faith. And so cultivating faith as a faculty. And so when we wander like this, we, we of course we can't store up food overnight we have to we're reliant on the alms round every day and so that means we have to find a village or a town to take out our bowl and find food in and then hope that somebody offers us food but that's where the faith faculty comes in and that we have this attitude we cultivate this attitude that if i get something that's fine if i get nothing that's good too being thus with regard to both you know, getting on with the practice if I get something, great, my body can have energy. If I get nothing, that's good too. The mind and the body are light, and I can still keep going. I can work with that. So trying to make the best of any situation that we're in. Of course, what happens when we're... The openness part is really, really important for this because if we're not open and if we try to go too long with a, like a set agenda, like we're going to walk a certain number of miles each day, for example, it's going to be hell. And even the little times when my openness disappeared and I decided I wanted to do this or I wanted to do that, it was, it already ruined it for that period of time. And then I had to kind of get the momentum of openness and confidence going again. So with Tudong, you really want to be guided by the generosity of others and just guided by the Dhamma, essentially. Do you have a few specific stories to give us of, you know, following that generosity, being touched by yeah. it, and, and maybe of clogging the pipes, of, you know, and breaking that at times? Absolutely. I have, uh, from our, the first Tudong that I did in America was with Tanti Tapo, who's, uh, who's not a monk anymore now, but um, that was in 2013. And it's a story I've told a number of times just because it was so powerful for both of us. It was day five of this particular Tudong, and it, I think it's when it kind of shifted into being less of a pilgrimage and more like a vision quest type thing that we were doing. And it was, uh, we were walking north out of Abayagiri, so we were walking up Highway 101 each day, and we got to this area that uh, I like to walk through called Avenue of the Giants, where there's these giant redwoods, and there's a little town called Phillipsville there. And it's got a population of, I don't know, uh, 150 or 200 or something. And so uh, it was time for alms round. We thought, well, this is this is where we're going to have to get food. If we get food, it's going to have to be from this little town. So there was a small market. Didn't look like there was much happening there. There's like a one car parked out front. And we were pretty sure we weren't going to get anything. And but we decided just to do our duty and take our alms bowls out and sling them over our right shoulder as we do under our robes and, and get ready to just walk back and forth through this tiny little town and just see what happened and fully expecting to not get anything because we couldn't see any possibility of getting anything but just doing our duty to go alms around and then right as we put our bowls on uh, a man sitting at a picnic table that we hadn't seen and he looked like he might might have been homeless he said hey i've got something for you over here we didn't say anything to him you know, we didn't explain anything to him he said hey big big guy uh, looked like a, a biker and, and uh he said, hey i've got something for you so we go over and he takes a lid off a five gallon bucket takes out a unopened bushel of fresh apples puts them in one of our bowls in an unopened big bag of carrots and puts it in our, the other bowl and then a big unopened jar of peanut butter and offers it and then and then asks us what we're doing <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it was very moving um, and he said he used to be he explained he used to be part of a biker gang and that he he hated everybody, he hated the world, and then he had some sort of change of heart, and now his practice was to love everybody and to love the world. And he was reading a Bible, 
also he was sitting at the picnic. We noticed he was sitting at the picnic table reading a Bible. And he gave us everything. The, the bucket was empty after he gave all that stuff to us. And it was all fresh, like nothing had been opened yet. And it was, it was so moving that we almost couldn't eat it, actually. So we walked down, we were looking for a place to eat, and um, sat down at a picnic table a little further on in like a forest grove, completely secluded, nobody around, and just sat there for like an hour and a half putting peanut butter on, like cutting the apples up slowly and putting globs of peanut butter on the apples, and it was like a really, really good meal. <laughs> <laughs> totally unexpected. You never could have guessed. So, so then you would think, oh, well, it's a one-off. That's totally magical and amazing. It's totally a one-off, not going to happen again. So the next day we, so I forget where we stayed that night. We stayed somewhere in a forest grove that night and then got to the next town the next day in time for alms round. It's called Miranda is the next town in north in the Avenue of the Giants. And so same thing. It was a very small town. There's a little bit more there. There's a couple of restaurants and a little market and, but not much activity happening. So we thought, okay, it's kind of the same thing. And we, it's about 9 a.m. or so. And then we say, okay, well, you know, we're not expecting what happened yesterday to happen again. Totally a one-off. And we put our, put our bowls on. Right away, this guy is like standing in front of us. And he says, I just gave money to that restaurant down there and uh, just go in and have whatever you want. And then he also gave offerings and gave us some crackers and protein bars, I think it was. He said, I've given money to this restaurant. Go in and have whatever you want. <laughs> so so we're okay. And, and uh, we walk to this restaurant, maybe, you know, 300 feet away or something. And so we go into this restaurant and uh, so can, can we help you? And uh, yeah, this, uh, this guy said he gave you money for us to <laughs> have me. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Sit down, sit down, sit down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we just ordered food and had a big meal. <laughs> so, so it's just uh, even more like, huh, okay. So I, I attribute these experiences to that, that kind of openness and the sadha, the sadha faculty as a faculty, not like, it's not even faith that you will be supported, but it's just faith as a faculty. It's just openness as a faculty, being totally prepared for anything and having no expectations at all. And then that, in a way, seems to magnetize those types of experiences to you. So, yeah, just um, yeah, hoping we can hear more stories about Tudong and pilgrimage and wanting to kind of maybe include uh, late people into this conversation. I think a lot of people who watch these uh, these clips um, are are not in robes. And I'm curious. I remember a story from before you ordained. You were very inspired as a lay person, hadn't ordained yet, and think, oh, I'll just go out to a forest, go camping, and it sounded like that, like really didn't work. And I'm curious if you could tell us that story and perhaps tell us like what qualities of mind you've kind of cultivated since then that have kind of made this camping, pilgrimage, Tudong experience more doable that you maybe didn't have at that point. Yeah, when I when I went to Hawaii at the age of 19, and when I dropped out of college and went to Hawaii and just started walking down the highway with a duffel bag, seeking a surfboard and a guitar, then uh, that, you know, that you could say that was a Tudong of sorts, although a real, I usually tell people that a real Tudong, you have to have a license, and your license is your bowl and your robes. And so that is the Tudong license um, as a layperson is going to be a different experience. Although now, as time goes on, I have heard a lot of stories similar to the stories I've told here and experienced by lay people, people being brought in by great generosity. And, and it is actually possible if you have the right attitude. So it does seem to be more dependent on your attitude rather than whether you have robes and bowl or not. But even that, even that this dovetails well with that entering the mandala idea. So even going to Hawaii and having these difficult experiences of being attacked by chihuahuas on a beach on the on eastern 
shore of Kauai when I was trying to camp out, not knowing anybody and just figuring out where to go and walking north. And, and uh, even that is like, well, that was day one. So it was like a difficulty, like a test. Like, do you really want to do this? Or are you really willing to go into the unknown in this way and be attacked by chihuahuas? Okay, How bad do you want that surfboard and guitar? And uh, I know on the Turang I did with Ajahn Kasapo in 2016, the 10 day, first day I was throwing up and just got super sick. I had food poisoning or something. I don't even know how I got it. And he was totally fine. And we stayed just at a house just north of Obayagiri in a very small town called Hearst and just stayed with some people who had given us an offer to stay at their place when we began these two dogs and ended up staying two nights because I was so sick. And and then I thought, am I just going to have to go back to Obayagiri? And, but then I got better and we kept walking. And when we kept walking, so if you want more stories, so <laughs> if when we kept walking, we were walking on Highway 101. Uh, we walked partly on the train tracks, the paralleling 101, but there's tons of ticks and they're super overgrown. So we ended up walking on the highway more actually. And so walking on the highway and I'd been sick the last couple of days and I was still like weak actually from this. And so we were, I remember we were walking up this hill and I was telling Ajahn Kasa, I was actually hanging back a bit. I think I was even walking behind Ajahn Kasapo and uh, saying, oh, well, it's going to be, it's going to be like midday. We're not going to be able to eat today. And we had been offered some breakfast at our other place, but um, not, it wasn't that much. And we were hoping for a meal, but we, there was no town or anything. So we're thinking, okay, well, uh, looks like we're, we're going to have to go hungry today. Maybe that small breakfast we had is going to have to be good enough. And we were just walking on the highway. We were miles away from the next town. And there's no way we were going to get there before midday. So I remember we walked up the highway up this hill. And then there was a pickup truck with a camper parked on the side of the highway with, a, with the tailgate down with a guy sitting on the tailgate waiting for us and had a camp stove out and said, hey, can I cook you guys a meal <laughs> on the highway? So we, we said, yeah, this is unbelievable that you're here now. <laughs> and so, uh, so then uh, he said, yeah, I'm making uh, asparagus burritos. Okay, awesome, great. And so we took a bit for us to put our packs down and take, like, gather in what was actually happening. And uh, there was kind of a turnout, so it was, it was a, we had some space. We put our sitting cloths on the dirt and got our bowls out, and he made us asparagus burritos and offered us other types of food into our bowls, and we had a pretty good meal and <laughs> totally totally like not just not expecting it but expecting to not eat like fully expecting to not there's there's no way we're going to get food today and sitting there and having having a meal and then um i remember asking him after the meal because he just sat and had his meal as well with us and um said uh what what made you stop and want to offer food to us? And he said, oh yeah, my, well, it's my understanding that it's rare to give to a Samana. And then he left. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a good opportunity. Samana being a, like a wandering. Religious, yeah, like a religious seeker. It's a rare opportunity to give to a religious seeker. So, okay, okay, yeah. He didn't say, oh yeah, I've been on the Obaigiri website and I know all about you and I know what the monks do and you do these things. And he said, oh, it's just rare to give to a religious seeker. <laughs> Seemingly had no really real connection to <laughs> Obaigiri or even Buddhism. I, I'm curious, like, part of like what all of these stories have in common and going on Tudong, walking on faith, um, 
is like a measure of like you're intentionally making yourself dependent i mean on a greater good and you don't know how that's going to manifest but you leave with very minimal requisites basically anything you're basically living in what you can carry on your back uh, or in your your bag um but there's certainly like this ideal in america especially of like this rugged independence and there's a very strong ethos from some people like what are you doing you know like all these stories like I find them very inspiring, you know, stories both of this, the monk, you know, being, yeah, doing something that's hard to do. It's not easy to live like that. And the lay people inspire because, you know, getting to spontaneously offer generosity, but some people see it as like, uh, you're a parasite. How do you think this is a good thing? What, what would be your response or what is your response when people come at you with that kind of energy? Like you're, you're just leeching. Yeah. yeah very rare, but you know, we do, we have gotten it a couple times on Tudong that, uh, you know, we should be working for food and 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 so on. Very rare, though. Mo- more often than not, people are very very positive about what we're doing because it's it's very good and inspiring to see religious seekers and causes people to reflect on their own conduct, their own, their own lives. What are they doing with their lives? But the times it does happen, usually it's like, well, you know, we're we we don't expect food from. From people if only if people are moved to give there's no no pressure at all on them to give so that people who have that attitude shouldn't give they shouldn't feel coerced or forced to give you know somebody who develops faith for themselves and confidence for themselves that can't be forced upon anybody so if somebody is skeptical of what we're doing or thinks that what we're doing has no benefit at all then they they shouldn't necessarily go against that but uh, what can what we can do in terms of Dhamma practitioners to help them to develop faith is to be totally okay with that and totally open to that energy actually it comes back to our own openness again totally open to them having that attitude towards us not like oh well you know you're you're you've got a lot of defilement or you're just a nasty person and I'm gonna avoid you but just being kind to them, like, oh yeah, I could totally see what you're saying, and yeah, we should we should work, you know, we shouldn't be lazy, and um, just being open to listening to them and hearing them out, and um, although sometimes it's not worth engaging that kind of energy, I know uh, on 2019 on Tudong with Ajahn Seik and Tan Tissero, we got to this town called Trinidad where we always get really good alms food at Murphy's Market at uh, Trinidad. And usually we'll stand there and right away people will come out and offer food to us. And uh, when we were walking up to the market, this guy drove up to us and he started being quite critical of us and giving us kind of a talk about how he, he's got uh, a problem with one arm. So he's only got one arm that he can use and he still gardens and works really hard and, and, and uh, toils away. And, and he, when he sees people like us, it makes him feel really annoyed and negative and I was kind of like engaging him, saying like, yeah, I understand, you know, where you're coming from. Ajahn Seik just walked away. He's like, well, I'm not engaging with this guy. Like he saw it right away. Like he just, this isn't worth engaging with. Like he wasn't going to develop faith. He wasn't worth putting effort into. So sometimes you do just have to walk away. And, and eventually I noticed that Ajahn Seik had just walked away. And I said, okay, thank you for your perspective. And I just, I just walked away as well and just ended the conversation. Uh, Ajahn, what's um, you know, you talk about that opening, and uh, I know often we translate um, satai to be a bit less uh, con to trigger sort of some Westerners a bit less by translating as like confidence or something. But but with faith, there really seems to be this quality, at least in what you're talking about, of uplift and love, almost of a, a real emotional aspect, which which confidence yeah. doesn't quite get at. Yeah. When did that side concretely manifest for you most? When was the turning point for you? Uh, it's an it's an ongoing process because the faith faculty, as a say, you have the five faculties, and sadha is the first faculty there, and that's a very important set in the Buddhist teaching. Sadha, virya, sati, samadhi, panya. Those are the five faculties. What are the English translations of that? That's uh, usually translated as faith, energy, mindfulness, concentration, and wisdom as the five faculties. And the Buddha, when he was still the Bodhisattva, talks about having these five faculties. 
He says, these five faculties are full in me, therefore I can direct my mind to accomplish anything that I want to accomplish because those five faculties are present. So that shows us that faith, for me, a reflection now is faith as a faculty in and of itself. Not faith in something, but faith as a heart faculty, as a mental quality that you can cultivate in and of itself. So it's not an even confidence in and of itself or courage in and of itself. So faith has that hint of courage there. Courage is the opposite of fear. So there's no fear. And also there is love or goodwill metta there as well, because that also occurs when fear isn't present. So there, is, all those things occur. You could think of faith as the opposite of fear. You could think of sattha as the opposite of bhaya, of uh, fear. We do have abhaya, which is fearless, but also you could think of sattha as an opposite to fear or an opposing force at the very least, because it, it's courage, openness. If you're, if you're fearful, if you're frightened, you're closed off. You're putting a shield around yourself. You're putting your armor on. You don't want to be open. You don't want to let things in. You don't want to let difficult energies in. You don't want to let difficult people in. So fear closes closes off, whereas sadha is like an opening. So you think of the Buddha with the ultimate in sadha as a power. You have the five faculties, the indriyas, but then when they're cultivated to the ultimate point, they become the balas or the powers. The five powers are the same as the five faculties, but when they're cultivated to their ultimate point, then they become powers. And when, when one reaches stream entry in the suttas, it says that one has confirmed faith or confirmed confidence. That sadha is then like, and it, it's bolstered up that much more. So when you're cultivating this as, a, as an actual faculty, that, that can be cultivated a lot over time. So that's a reflection for me these days is, how do I put, how do I strengthen that faith faculty in and of itself? Rather than trying to convince myself I should have faith in something or I should have confidence in Buddha Dhamma Sangha because of this and this and this reason. It's not, faith is not convincing yourself based on your intellect or your knowledge. Faith is a heart quality that arises when you get inspired by true Dhamma, true teachings. Tantra, can you talk about uh, a bit more about that in terms of how like faith might transfer? So I've had this experience say, I live very close to Lumpur Pasano. I see him in many different situations. I've got faith in Lumpur Pasano. And then he's got faith in Lumpur Liam. And so for me, it's easy to make that next shift because although I have been cultivating faith in a particular person, I'm also cultivating the faculty at the same time. And then it can just shift. In your experience, how does that, most people, most Westerners are interested in meditation. Yeah. How does all this like specialized faith shift over and support meditation or does it? Uh, it absolutely has to support meditation because you've got samadhi in there as well as one of the faculties and eventually one of the powers. But faith in a person is good. But if you have faith in a person, it's good to back it up and see what is that faculty of faith if you minus the person. What is that? What is that faith? Because there, in the suttas you have that too. There's a sutta about the, the drawbacks of having confidence in a person. You have confidence in a teacher who is inspiring. Maybe they follow the Dutanga practices and you're very inspired by them and they give good Dhamma talks, they give good teachings and then they disrobe. Or and then there's some sort of scandal and you're heartbroken, you can't believe it. And will that, that's where you, te that's where your faith gets tested. If you have faith in Lumpur Liam, say if Lumpur Liam was to suddenly disrobe, which I'm sure he wouldn't, but <laughs> if just hypothetically speaking, um, then where where is the faith? So if our faith is put with the person or it's dependent on the person, then it's not that strong yet. Um, it's not really a faith faculty yet. But if we have faith that's cultivated as a faculty and that person is just, say, a catalyst for that faith, that's that's very a very important distinction. Because if our faith is just dependent on a person, then they say a senior monk, our teacher, he disrobes, well, I'm going to disrobe as well because my faith was completely dependent on that person being a monk. So uh, you had that with when Lumpur Cha passed away, a lot of the monks disrobed because their faith was placed completely in Lumpur Cha and completely dependent on having Lumpur Cha there. But then for the monks who had developed faith as a faculty, they were able to actually say, well, this, you know, honor Lumpur Cha in a way by actually 
continuing on as monks and continuing on with their spiritual training. And so it's uh, it's super important to come back to faith as a faculty. Thank you, Ajahn. Do you have any you know advice for just um you know it seems like part of cultivating this openness is also putting yourself in these situations that are truly open for uh, a lay person who has a pretty full life and many duties you know marriage kids job how do they cultivate faith in this way or, or this openness you know what would be some concrete ways you could think of them to yeah that? and i can try to link that with the idea of meditation faith and meditation too uh well for a for a lay person who has got the whole list of everything you know uh, yoga mom, soccer, kids, you know, three kids, jo uh, three jobs, um, whatever, and going to college, or, you know, the sort of high-powered American lifestyle. If you've got that, then that has to be your practice. Of course, if you're going to try to only, you can only do so much in 24 hours. If you try to add a meditation practice to all that, you're going to have to cancel something else out. You're going to have to quit one of your three jobs or take less classes or have less kids. Um, that's maybe not an option, but, uh, yeah, you, whatever you're doing, whatever you're, whatever you've chosen to take on, that has to be your practice. Of course, if you have all those things going on, yes, you're, you're not going to be able to dive deep into the practice in the way that, that some practitioners who try to shed all of the external things, uh, I mean, even, even the monks have duties and stuff, but the precepts help us to shed a lot of distractions and actually focus more on the practice. Um, but faith is a, coming back to Ajahn Kogilo, faith is a faculty for meditation or as a precursor to meditation or a foundation for meditation. Super important as well because when we, it's like the old phrase, if we, how we do anything is how we do everything. So if we go through our lives with that openness to whatever is arising in the present, then inevitably we're going to relate to our meditation in the same way. And so when we're meditating, we're going to be open to whatever's, whatever's arising in the mind. And so when we think about, usually when we hear the word concentration or we think about samadhi, we might be very, very sincere in wanting to try as hard as we can to get into samadhi. The problem with that is it's going from a preconceived idea of what samadhi is. Nobody can really describe to us what it is. It's, it's ehi pasiko, it's the come and see dhamma. It's the, we have to know, it's the pachatang. We have to know for ourselves. Um, it could be described to us that it's, you know, it's got piti sukha, it's got vitaka vichara, piti sukha ekagata. You can have that described to you. But the problem with the descriptions is that the trap so many of us fall into is that we then just try to intellectually or cognitively create that experience based on the suttas rather than the that's where the sadha comes in that openness to what we're experiencing so yes we can consciously cultivate those qualities of piti sukha and so on but then like something like ekagata is translated as one pointedness so we might misunderstand anything we need a laser focus right at the certain point on the nose and it has to be extremely tight blotting out everything else but then other translations of Vekagata like singleness of purpose. And then that matches the description of like Vitaka Vichara still being present in the first jhana. And so if you were just in the first jhana with just a blotting out everything else, just a tiny point of light or whatever, then Vitaka Vichara wouldn't be present and it would be something else. So, and Piti and Sukha, we hear descriptions of those, but we really have to it's we have to let go of our preconceived idea about what that might be we might think oh i don't have piti sukha because i'm not like like exploding with bliss and it's not like this kind of crazy like almost orgasmic meditation <laughs> that i'm having you know it's like we that's uh of course that's what we want we want plateau experiences we want peak experiences we we're meditating with that it's inevitable we're going to be meditating with that attitude uh, right off the bat. But then what it is about is it's addressing addiction at its very root, addressing the desire for 
peak experience is at its very root, is that addressing the seeking for peak experiences at its very root. So we're coming back to that openness. We're coming back to that quality of just, let's just, let's just learn how to relax. Let's just be open, relaxed, and uh, just be open to what, what is in the mind, to learning about ourselves, learning about our own mind, and just take it slow. Uh, that's so important. And that takes faith, that takes sadha, that takes confidence. Anything else? Yeah, Tanya John, thank you. Is that so good much. enough? Yeah, okay. it's great. <laughs> thank you so much. John. Can we have respect to you? Yeah, it's nice that we're doing that and doing this interview in this location. Yeah. great uh, pilgrimage of your own these next few months, Ajahn. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I'm open to whatever arises. And